No, no, it's just it's normal thing. Is your working? No, it's it's not. Hello? Yes, this one is me. Okay. All right. Okay, good morning. Thank you and uh, welcome back to the session. This session is all about the number theoretic transform. First talk is multimodal entities for Sabre and Cortex and 3 mm 4 and will be presented by Vincent Wang. Okay, uh, thank you for your introduction. This paper, I would like to talk about our paper, Multimodal Entities for Sabre on Cortex M3 and Cortex M4. This is a joint work with Amin, Jinpong, Yu Jia, Matthias, and Boeing. Okay, uh, I submit the uh, previous uh, slide, but I'll give a brief summary about our contributions. So the first contribution looks into the time memory trade-off of Sabre on Cortis and four. Our time memory trade-off is about, can be divided into two parts. The first one is about how to multiply two polynomials on Cortis and four. The second time memory trade-off looks into the structure of matrix to vector multiplication. Our second contribution looks into the first order mask matrix vector product and inner product which are used in the decapitalization of Sabre. Our third contribution refers to the uh, implementation considerations for Sabre on Cortex M3. Sabre is a finalist, finalist of the third NIST PQC standardization. The authors propose three parameter sets. In this talk, we'll only focus on the parameters L and mu, where L refers to the dimension of the matrix and mu is related to the maximum possible value of the secret polynomial. In Sabre, the most time consuming operation is to multiply the public matrix A by secret vectors S and S prime. In key generation, we multiply the transpose of A and the and in encryption, we multiply A by S prime. I'll go through an overview of entity-based metric vector multiplication for Sabre. The idea is that we want to compute the metric vector product in Z by, cho by uh, choosing a large modulus Q prime. So as long as we choose a large Q prime bonding the maximum possible value, the result will coincide to the result in Z. Since entities are isomorphisms, we first apply MDTs to the entry to each of the components of that matrix and the vector. Then we accumulate in NTT domain followed by applying inverses of MDTs. In total, we only need to 2 plus L NDTs, L inverses of NDTs and L to 2 based multiplications, which are fairly cheap. I'll go through some basic ideas about number theoretical transforms. The number theoretic transforms refers to an isomorphism from of x over x to n minus zeta to the n to the product ring. Alternatively, I also denote the NDT as a map mapping L of x to an n tuple of elements in R. Very frequently, uh, n are chosen to be highly composite, and we're in the most frequently seen cases are the power of two. We can apply Kuluchi FFP splitting down to uh, emitting order of n log n uh, computations. Instead of looking at factorizing the polynomial ring by looking at the uh, polynomial moduli, we instead look into the factorization of coefficient rings. In particular, suppose we have and I bring isomorphism from ZQ0, Q1 to the product of ZQ0 and ZQ1, then we can first split the coefficient ring into, two, uh, into a product of two coefficient ring, followed by applying NDTs defined over these two coefficient rings. Finally, if we solve for CRT at the end, then 
it can be shown that results are exactly the same as applying NDT over R. Our first time mirror trade-off is about how to multiply two polynomials. Uh, when we count the memory usage for the buffers and the public polynomials, it should be noted that the public polynomials are sampled on the fly. So as long as we sample and expand a polynomial, we'll later recycle the memory usage. Finally, I'll ignore the memory usage for secret polynomials, and this is closely related to uh, the structure of the, of, of the program. We first recall the 32-bit uh, NEV based approach. Suppose uh, each line segment represents a continuous block of uh, 1496 bits. This implies that we can store a size 256 polynomial of 32-bit coefficients in two continuous line segments. So for the 32-bit approach, we need four line segments. And here is an illustration. Next, we look into the 16-bit computation. For doing 16-bit computation in a very stack efficient fashion, we interleave the computation of 16-bit arithmetic as follows. So we first uh, compute all the 16-bit NDTs for A, but only uh, the NDT for B over one coefficient. And we do the same thing for another coefficient ring. Finally, we solve the CRT. This is how we uh, compute the uh, multiply two polynomials with system B arithmetic. Our organization began with uh, some very unusual characterization about NG computation on Cortex M4. We observed that on Cortex M4, one 32 bit NUT is much faster than two 16 bit NUTs. So we start by thinking, is it possible to have some speed optimization, even if we're dealing with very stack if optimized implementations? So we start with looking at the 16-bit computation, and we identify at which point that the corresponding elements in the two coefficient rings are both stored in memory. We then replace the follow-up computation with uh, the corresponding operation over the large coefficient ring. And here is a, a quick illustration. So we start with 32-bit NUTs, convert the results into 16-bit NUTs, do, followed by uh, the corresponding operation in, with 16-bit uh, arithmetic. And then we solve for CRT immediately instead of applying 16-bit inverses of NUTs. And finally, we'll apply 32-bit inverses of NETs. This is a summary of the overall, of the three different strategies. The first two columns are together implement a very stack efficient and yet somewhat speed optimized polynomial allocations. The third column refers to the 32-bit uh, approach and the fourth column refers to the 16-bit approach in terms of cycle count, uh, we find that uh, the combination of 32-bit and 16-bit NUTs is between the 32-bit and 16-bit NUT approach. And uh, if, we, if we look into the stack consumption, the first two columns use exactly the same of, of the, the stack as the fourth column. Our next time and trace off looks into uh, the structure of metric to vector multiplication. For applying NGT to metric vector multiplication, uh, we propose four strategies and they are distinguished by uh, two different, by making two decisions. The first decision is, do we want to cache the NGT of the vector or not, or do we want to uh, recompute it every time? The second decision is to accumulate the results in any domain or not. And these four strategies result in different degree of time memory trade-offs. The first, for key generation, we want to compute with strategies A, B, and D. As for, uh, sorry about this, uh, as for encryption, 
we will employ strategies A, C, and D. Our third contribution is about first order mass metric vector modification and inner product, which are used in the decapsulation of SABER. For the first order mass implementation, we split the secret into two arithmetic shares. As for the public polynomials, they remain the same. So, we, so at first, it seems that we only need to apply entities to A once and entities to both of the shares. Unfortunately, uh, for applying entity-based metric vector modification, we want to compute the result in Z. So, but now uh, because of the first order mass property, uh, the coefficient ring of the secret vector of the secret vectors are now regarded as Z8192. To overcome this uh, obstacle, we compute one 32 bit NDT and one 16 bit NDT. So essentially, we we'll compute a precision of 48 bits for the, uh, for the entire measured vector multiplication. So in total, we need LTL2 plus 2L 32 bit NDTs and LTL2 plus 2L 16 bit NDTs, and a similar amount for the inferences. Next, we we'll look into how to implement Saber on Cortex M3. There are significant uh, differences between them in terms of performance. The first one is that there, there are no floating point registers and there are no DSP extension. The absence of DSP extension degrades the system bit computation. As for the long multiplication, it can only be applied to computing secret data. So we can only use it to compute the public metrics. As for the 32 bit uh, computation for the secret, we have to emulate the 32 bit arithmetic. This is implemented in the paper GKS21. Now, the question is that we want to know. Uh, on Cortex M4, we know that 32 bit NUT is much faster than two 16 bit NUTs. And on Cortex M3, uh, we want to know since both arithmetics are degraded, we want to know which is better. And uh, we're looking at, we'll look at the first two items. Uh, the first items, uh, the NUT in the first item refers to a pair of system B and UT. So this is an overview of the computation. As for the 32 bit computation, for the matrix A, we apply NTT lead, which is a native 32 bit computation. And for the secret of S and the inverse of NTT, we apply the constant time 32 bit NTT, which use the emulated 32 bit arithmetic. This is a, a, a summary of multiplying two polynomials of these two approaches. And we find that uh, system B entities performs the best. This is a, a over, overall performance number of unprotected stable on Cortex M4. In the literature in particular, uh, CHK plus 21 already shows that uh, NDT based modification result in very speed optimized implementations. We slightly optimized some uh, arithmetic like uh, packing and um, unpacking polynomials. So our implementation is slightly faster than their work. In terms of stack usage, our heavily stacked entity based approach achieves almost amount and sometimes superior to the uh, most stack efficient non entity based approach, which is implemented by MKV20. For Max Saber, we experiment with uh, the parameter Saber where L is equal to three. And by choosing uh, various kinds of strategies, we are able to outperform an existing work with Tumku. We also calculate the ratio of the overhead between strategies. And in the paper, we also provide our results of TVLA test about the validity about the validity of the masking. Finally, uh, 
for the results on quarter SM3, we find that all the NQE based approach outperform the existing Tim Cook approach in terms of performance and stack usage. And among the NQE keys, system B NQE keys perform the best in terms of performance and stack usage. This is a summary of the results in terms of overall performance. On quarter SM4, uh, we know that NQE keys perform the best in speed. And surprisingly, without optimization for the heavily stack optimized NGE based approach, it, it performs almost the same as other non NGE based approach that are spe specifically optimized for speed. In terms of stack usage, our stack optimized NGE performs similarly to the non NGE based approach. On Cortex M3, uh, we find that NUTs perform the best and CCB NUTs are the best approaches. Thank you for your attention. We have a time for questions. Questions from one. All right, then let me ask the first question. So you um, you use data optim organization to improve um, the performance of the entity. And I was wondering, are there any other aspects in the organ organizing data in memory that would improve performance if you uh, uh, implement the entity? Because entity has this DSP-like structure. So I'm assuming address generation or other aspects may also affect the performance. Uh, so, so uh, I, I don't really get. I mean, you mean uh, about regarding the performance of entities? Uh, yeah, the performance of entity. So you optimize the performance of entity by organizing uh, the, the memory polynomials in memory. Yes. Are there specific uh, other specific aspects of organizing uh, memory um, oh, okay. or uh, um, allocating memory to optimize performance? Uh, okay, it's actually uh, from here. So uh, the, the idea is that uh, in, in a system B entity based approach, we first, com we first compute the system B entities for polynomial A. Now our observation is that since the system B results are already in memory, so instead of applying two system B entities, we want to replace that computation with one 32 bit entity because we know on cross section four that 32 bit entities are amazing fast. So by applying a similar idea to the inverses of system B and keys, we're able to achieve another speed up, even with, uh, with the same uh, stack usage. And these are uh, resulting uh, polynomial location. So instead of uh, applying system B and keys, we simply apply one certain to B and key. So two continuous line segments can store a uh, 32 bit polynomials. And later, since uh, we did not modify anything for the base modification, we have to first reduce the 32 bit results into two system bit polynomials. So, this is how we do. And the second module reduction can actually be performed in place if we perform the module reduction at the beginning. Now, uh, after the base modifications, we solve the CRT immediately instead of applying the inverse of system B and UTs because they are amazingly fast. And this, the, so the, for solving CRT, we can also solve it uh, with, uh, with, with, with this memory layout if we solve the coefficient at the beginning. Now we only we can apply the 32 bit inverse of NUTs. This is how uh, we, are able, we are able to achieve some speed optimization for the heavily stack optimized implementation. Thank you. Questions in the audience? Then, oh, there's a question there, okay. 
So these uh, entities you use now are for analog implementations. Have you looked at quantum implementations? Uh, for the max implementations, uh, we utilize an existing work on max saber. So our work is simply replacing the the metric vector modification in inner product, while for the other parts, they are all the same as an existing uh, first order max term group. But they still do it because you would expect that they're bigger. You don't have support issues anymore? Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, yes. Well, for so for the stack optimized, sorry, for the speed optimized invitations. We indeed need much more memory for comparing to the speed optimized tune cook. So this is uh, uh, so uh, so uh, what I'm talking about is about uh, strategy A. So to achieve heavily stack optimization, uh, we compute entities every time whenever we expand the uh, sorry whenever we uh, acquire the result from the secret polynomials. So there are large a significant amount overhead on the amount of entities if we want to go for the heavily stack optimized imitation. And, uh, but we can recycle uh, the memory if we compute the entity of S every time. This is why we're able to achieve uh, the stack optimized implementation. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker. So we now move to the second talk. The second talk will be presented by Hanno Becker. And his paper is on neon um, entity, faster dilithium, kyber, and saber on Cortex A72 and Apple M1. Paper will be presented by Hanno. Um, his co authors are Vincent Wang, um, Matthias Kanisher, Boyin Yang, Shanyi Yang. And as soon as we're ready, we'll go ahead. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm speaking about Neon NTT, Faster Dilithium, Kyber, and Saver on A72 and um, Apple M1 with Vincent, Matthias, Bohin, and, and Shang Yi. So there are three parts to the talk. First, it's somewhat theoretical. I'm going to discuss a relation between two known methods for modular reduction, which is Montgomery reduction and Barrett reduction. And um, we are using this relation between the two to extend it to a relation, a similar relation between Montgomery multiplication <clears throat> and a somewhat new primitive called Barrett multiplication. In the second part, we switch to practice. We implement this on AH64 with NEON. Um, we extend it to NDT implementation, polynomial multiplication, and then the top level schemes. And finally, we look at our um, results and reflect a bit on that. So, I want to start by explaining this relation between Montgomery and Barrett reduction. And in the end, it's a simple reduction that I'm sure everyone who sits down and tries to prove it will calculate in a few lines. But at least if I speak from my experience, it won't tell you much. So um, what I'm trying to do in the next two slides, which are somewhat theoretical-ish, um, is to give you an intuition of why there should be a relation between Barrett and Montgomery reduction in the first place. And I'm doing this by introducing both from scratch but in a way that makes the parallel clear. So um, the idea of um, modular reduction, you have a number Z, which you'd like to reduce with respect to some modulus N. So what you want to do classically is you find a multiple of the modulus, which is close to the number you aim to reduce with respect to the Euclidean metric, the standard metric on numbers. And you do this by picking for this multiple, some integer approximation to the rational quotient of Z divided by n. So the best choice you would do normally is the actual rounding of c mod n to an integer, but some other close-ish integer might do as well. And then z minus kn is a small number in the Euclidean sense, and it's the same modulo n. So you have achieved your goal of finding a smaller representative. And what you do concretely in Barrett reduction, because z mod n is difficult to compute, is you pick a two power r, which is bigger than um, n, 
And then you approximate this Z mod N that you actually want to compute in a two-step fashion. So you artificially introduce this R into the fraction. That's the first step. And then you do proper rounding on the outer quotient and you use some pre-computed approximation for the R um, mod, um, over N in the nominator. And I'm using those funny brackets here because uh, you can do this with any choice of pre-computed approximation. For now, you can think of rounding, but later it will be important that you can actually pick a diff slightly different approximation, which will be good from an implementation perspective. And the reason why we do this funny introduction of R is that dividing by R is just a shift. Um, now we can introduce Montgomery reduction in very similar terms. We can say that we aim to reduce a number Z by finding a multiple of the modulus, which is close to, the, um, to Z, not in the Euclidean metric, but in the P, uh, two adding metric. And uh, what this concretely means is a number is two addically small if it's divisible by a high power of two. So for example, two, four, eight, 16, that would be a sequence converging to zero. And the number is large if it has a large two power in the denominator. So one half or one over four and so on, that would go to infinity. It's the exact opposite of what you have in the Euclidean metric. So in other words, we are trying to choose K to approximate Z mod N, but not in the Euclidean sense, but in the two addict sense. And then Z minus KN is two addically small, which as I just explained, just means that it's divisible by a high power of two. So then you can divide by that high power of two, and then you get what you actually care about, which is Euclidean small representative. And that's Montgomery reduction. And um, if you sit down and look at how you normally define Mon Montgomery reduction, you will notice that what's precisely done is the following. Again, you pick a two power, uh, R bigger than N, and then you approximate Z uh, over N in the two adding metric to quality one over R, and the thing you're approximating it by is a number between minus R half and R half. And um, you can normalize the whole thing by this um, number R. And an alternative formulation would be to approximate um, Z over N over R by a number between minus one half and one half to the quality one. So note one thing, um, well, no, okay, let's go to the next slide. So let's reflect a little bit on this. In both cases, we did some kind of rounding, but different kinds of roundings. So in the um, in the rounding in the sense that you have something large, continuous, and you aim to express it as a sum of something discrete and some small elements. And in the Euclidean sense, of course, you just use, you round a real number to an integer and the error is a number between minus one half and one half. But in the two addict sense, it's funnily, it's a bit strange, it's, the other way around. What we round to is a number between minus one and one half, minus one half and one half. And the rounding error is a two adic integer. So if you think about it for a second, you realize we are actually, actually doing the same thing on both sides. It's just the role of what we round to and what is the error, it's just reversed. So if you have a number, a rational number, which has just twos in the denominator, not no other prime, then actually the number is just the sum of those two different kinds of roundings. And um, if we just now recall that on the last slide, we explained Barrett reduction and Montgomery reduction as in some way described via Euclidean rounding and two adic rounding, the precise formulas don't matter here, then it's not so surprising anymore that somehow there should be a relation between them if they are essentially the same, those two kinds of rounding. So um, long story short, um, there is a relation and it's very simple. I'm going to explain that in a second, but let me emphasize again that you can sit down and calculate that for yourself easily. Um, but I hope the last slides give you some idea of why you should expect this in the first place. So the relation is that the Barrett reduction of a number Z is the Montgomery reduction of that number Z times R mod N. And now let's quickly reflect on why we cannot expect something like Barrett is the same as Montgomery. The Barrett reduction reduces the input, produces a new representative of the input. The Montgomery reduction has an inherent division by this R. So the output of the Montgomery reduction is a representative of Z over R. So any relation has to introduce this factor R somehow. And in this sense, it's as simple as you can hope for. 
Um, there are some you have to be careful with the sign a little bit, but um, at the end of the day, it's, it's a really a very simple relation. Um, so why should we care? Um, I personally find it's a curious relation. Um, second, whatever bound you have for either side, you can transfer to the other side. And thirdly, which we're going to explore on the next slide, um, well, we know there's Montgomery multiplication, but what's the analog on the Barrett side, kind of? And um, after we wrote this paper, we found an older paper where we found that this, what we call Barrett multiplication, in the, is, was already known and sometimes called Schub multiplication in the unsigned context um, without this relation to Montgomery. Um, and we are using it in the sign context, but um, yeah. Um, the idea is uh, very simple. Let's just recall what we did in the classical Barrett reduction. So we did this two-step approximation of, um, of Z uh, over N. And let's just say Z now is the product of two numbers. Z is AB. Then we can slightly tweak this to make the approximation a little bit better by pulling in one of the factors, the B, into, um, into the pre-computed approximation R over N. So you see, the, the second line is almost the same as the first with Z equals AB, but not quite because we pulled the B into the approximation. And um, if you do this, and we're looking at the implementation aspects of this in a second, this relates to Montgomery um, multiplication in the same way as we just explained. And um, you have to note though that this Barrett multiplication really only works for a multiplication with a constant because you have to pre-compute this BR over N. Um, yeah, but for an NGT where you know the constants that works. Um, so, so much for um, the, the conceptual part. Let's look at how you would actually implement this and why should we care? And we'll find that the Barrett multiplication is from an implementation perspective actually much, much better. Um, but first, how do we um, implement Montgomery multiplication on, on NEON? Um, we had it yesterday in the talk. Uh, Montgomery multiplication can be expressed as uh, two high multiplications and a low multiplication. And if you try this on NEON, um, you will find that mm, doesn't quite work. There is no high multiply. But um, what you find is that there's a doubling high multiply and you can use that and you compensate the doubling by use of a halving subtract. So that works. Um, and we see the sequence here. But now let's switch to, to Barrett again. And here it's nicely dual. The instruction distribution is not, uh, is the other way around. It's not too high multiplication and a low multiplication. It's too low multiplications and a high multiplication. And let's just um, think about this for a second. Uh, in the top, you have the, 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 the definition. Now, the, the components of this um, term are double with numbers, but the result is a single with number. So instead of computing AB double with, we compute it single with in the first place. So it's a low multiplication for AB. And the same for this n times the funny rounding. It's also, uh, we can compute this as a low multiplication. And it's only this big quotient that has to be computed as a rounding high multiply. And um, you, you see this here, how you would implement this in, in NEON, two low and one high multiply. And this is better than Montgomery multiplication in two ways, at least. First, it's straightforward to merge the high multiply and the subtraction into, um, into a multiply subtract. So one instruction less, but what's more um, interesting perhaps is that microarchitecturally, many CPUs have um, forwarding paths if you have chains of multiply accumulates, so, which make them faster than generic use of um, the result of multiply instructions. And we can leverage this um, fast forwarding here and the Montgomery multiplication doesn't have that. Um, there's one issue here, which you might have noticed. We again have this nasty doubling. And that's the reason why we carried around this generality all the time. We have this um, approximation and never said what it actually is. And what we do here is the, we, we pick round to the next even number. And if we round to the next even number, we can compensate for the doubling that's inherent in this high multiplication, which is multiplying with half of what we actually want to multiply with. Um, yeah, um, next, 
The other component in an entity-based polynomial multiplication is the base multiplication. And often you need to accumulate multiple products. And if you accumulate multiple products, it's actually better to compute them in double width and reduce only once in the end rather than multiply, reduce, multiply, reduce, and so on. And I don't want to explain this in, in a lot of detail um, or in any detail at all, but um, the previous sequence for this, we, we found a better way to write this, shorten it from nine to, to seven instructions in, in NEON, such a long multiply accumulate. Um, okay, finally, the, we implemented the number theoretic transform uh, for Kyber, Dilithium, and Sabre. Compared to x86, it's perhaps uh, noteworthy that there's really no difference between doing, not much difference between doing it on 16 or 32 bit. The instructions have kind of variance for either case. It's just a little bit more intra vector shuffling in the 16 bit case. So we use this Barrett multiplication for multiplication with constants. We use this double width multiplication for um, the base. And um, whatever intra vector shuffling we need, we do via those de interleaving loads and stores. Um, okay. Next um, trick ish is that it's it's well known that to amortize the cost of the NTT, you should compute an NTT domain as, as much as you can. So better go into NTT domain once, do your stuff, multiply, add whatever, and then go back rather than going back and forth all the time. And you can do this because it's an isomorphism. But you can do you can go one step further by saying that, well, any pre-computation that I have to do on my data in NTT domain before I can operate with it, if I use this operand multiple times, I might as well cache the pre-computation. It's um, clear. Um, and one instance of this that we observed is that the, the base multiplication usually works in a very small truncated polynomial ring. So K is, uh, is very small here. And we, off, we need to, um, to compute this base multiplication. We need to scale the input, one of the input polynomials with a constant. So what you can do is just use, if you use this operand multiple times, you cache the scaling by this constant. It's uh, not rocket science. When we call it asymmetric multiplication, because now you have one operand which comes to serve with the scaling and the other operand doesn't have the scaling. That's why it's asymmetric. Um, and then we have, we found some tricks for the scheduling of butterflies between the different layers here. The idea is that if you have, um, you should schedule the butterflies in one layer in such a way that um, those coefficients you will need first in the next layer are computed first in the previous layer. Um, and um, so there are, um, for further information and generalizations, I invite you to look into um, Vincent's thesis. Um, okay, finally, the results. Um, we benchmarked on A72 and um, Apple M1. We had as a baseline neon-based implementations for Kyber and Sabre. And um, for Delithium, there was just a C implementation. And you see lots of numbers on the right here. I'm not going through all of them, but what you see are um, the performance counts for matrix vector and um, multiplication and scalar products. And um, the, the, the performance speed ups we get on A72 is roughly one and a half to two, and on Apple M1 to two to two and a half. And um, just, you might be surprised why, why is there a different speed up on say Apple M1 than Cortex A72? And you can actually explain that. Um, we are going from a nine instruction sequence as it was previously for modular multiplication to a three instruction sequence. It seems like a huge improvement, but um, if you look a little bit closer, you will find that this nine instruction sequence uses long multiplies, which on A72 actually have twice the throughput than the single width multiplies that we use on our three instruction sequence. So a good chunk of the nine to three speed up is lost because on this particular CPU, well, they happen to be a bit slower. It's still better, but not as much as you would think if you compare nine and three. Whereas on um, later CPUs, and that includes, as we think, Apple M1, but it um, also includes, say, Cortex A78. So there are lots of follow up CPUs above 72. Um, you will also see this, and then you will see the bigger speed up. 
And yeah, unsurprisingly, the speed up compared to reference C code is, is very large. So it's a worthwhile endeavor. And if we look at the, the top level schemes, the performance improvements are watered down by the dominance of SHA-3, which is not a huge um, surprise. Um, but so in summary, we found a relation between Montgomery and Barrett reduction. We extended that to a primitive called Barrett multiplication, which we used for faster implementation of the number theoretic transform on NEON. Um, so avenues for future work is, um, I'll study the entity a little bit closer on other microarchitectures. We have A72, Apple M1, but there's kind of a whole range of stuff that we haven't touched on, um, say A510, 710X2, something like this. And we are working on that. And um, a paper that with Matthias that was just online yesterday is um, improving the performance of SHA-3 on ARCH64. So that should be plugged in as well and will give a good speed up, we hope. Um, thank you. Let's thank the speaker. We have time for a few questions. Let me ask you, um, will your, there's a question? Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering, if you have done any of your performance optimizations, if you want to do further optimizations, um, if you want to do further optimization, do you find the problem with your lead bound or memory bound with them? Uh, um, uh, it's still compute bound, I would say, yeah. because in, you, oh, I, I should have said that with ARCH64 Neon, you have 32 registers, that's quite a lot. You can do um, four layers of entity at once. So um, yeah, there's really a lot of compute after comparatively few loads. Yeah. Question. I like to explore the fact of the reduction in the day. Um, were you able to have to take the times multiply the reduction strategy from the last year of the grants? Planter multiplication? Yeah. Uh, I'm afraid I haven't yet looked into that. I'm sorry. Okay, so that's not part of this paper, yes. This is not part of the paper. Go ahead. <laughs> Can I ask, will, will there be just artifact of your implementations? Um, yeah, there is a chess artifact of this, isn't there? It's all, oh yeah, um, all code is already online. Thank you. All right, last chance. Oh, there's one online. So, yeah, I missed that. No, there's just somebody talking online. All right, let's thank the speaker. Hmm. Great. Right, we have, um, we're going to the next talk on NTT. Yes, yes. Title is Multiparameter Support with Entities for NTRU and NTRU Prime uh, on Cortex M4. It's um, a paper by Erdem Alkin, Vincent Wang, and Bo Yin Yang. And we'll have uh, Vincent Wang who is presenting. Yeah, I'll test the control. Uh, okay, thank you. 
Uh, thank you for your introduction. I'll go straight. Uh, our entity-based point of location for entry entry plan or Cortex-04 boil down to computing the product in, uh, computing the results in Z of X. And we'll finally reduce the, Z, the result in Z of X to the target polynomial rings. That this approach greatly reduces the engineering effort because when we switch to a different polynomial rings, we only need to replace the reduction stage rather than the entire polynomial location. For computing the results in Z of X, we choose large Q prime and N so that the result in this polynomial ring coincides to the result in Z of X. We propose three different Ns and there are 1440, 1536, and 1728. Next, I'll talk about some improvement on the Redis R butterflies, where R is an odd number. We are able to reduce, replace R minus one modifications with R minus one additions and subtractions by extending the existence of subtraction in Redis 2 to Redis R butterflies. And after a series of uh, reductions, we argue that instead of looking at all the odd numbers, we actually only need to optimize for the R's that are Fermi primes. In our paper, we implement for Redis 3 and, and propose a draft for Redis 5. Next, I'll talk about two rarely seen uh, fast Fourier transforms. The first one is Good Thomas FFT as an algebra isomorphism. In particular, it introduced the equivalence between X to V and the product of the two variables. In the literature, the same equivalence was actually introduced and implemented in the paper FP07 for the ease of vectorization implementation. In our paper, we are not vectorizing for Cortesian 4. We instead point to another use of the idea, namely how to address potential, potential cosine issues if we want to permute implicitly for the good Thomas FFT. The second FFT is Redis vector Redis FFT. It is essentially a multidimensional generalization of FFT. So the building blocks, instead of one dimensional any keys, the building blocks are all multidimensional butterflies. Furthermore, we also propose dedicated Redis 2-3 butterflies supporting the implicit permutations. This is a summary of uh, the applicability of our convolutions. Since we compute the results in Z of X, as long, the larger the convolution it is, the wide applicability it is. In n to n prime, we are targeting the big by small polynomial locations, where a polynomial is called small if all of the coefficients are bounded by, are all in zero, and plus minus one. In n true, we target the ring dq of x over x to n minus one, where q is a power of two and n is a prime. And uh, I only use n as a prime in this slide. For the follow-up slides, they are all refers to the dimension of a convolution. For n true prime, we target the ring zq of x over x to p minus x minus one, where p and q are primes such that the ring becomes a finite field. I'll slide, uh, review some notations about uh, number theory transforms. So anchor keys is an isomorphism from R of x over x to n minus zeta to the n to the product ring. And I also write it as the map from the polynomial f of x to an r tuple of elements in R. Good Thomas FFT uh, is uh, essentially can be characterized as an algebra isomorphism. And in the survey paper by Dr. Dan Bernstein, he explained Good Thomas FFT as an group algebra isomorphism. So we start at a group isomorphism from G to the product of G0 and G1. Then this induces an isomorphism from the group algebra of G to the tensor product of group algebras. In the language of polynomials, we look at the uh, group isomorphism from ZQ0, Q1 to the product of ZQ0 and Q1. So we have a tensor product of polynomial rings. 
However, uh, the originally proposed good Thomas FFT is actually much more stronger than, uh, than just as a group ultra-isomorphism. Essentially, uh, the FFT is about a one-to-one -one correspondence between the set of any keys and the set of tensor product of any keys by permuting the coefficients. So no arithmetics are introduced for, perform for establishing the one-to-one uh, -one correspondence. The second FFT is about is vector redis FFT, and it can be explained with the language of tensor tensor products. Uh, recall that if we have a tensor product of composition of functions, then it can be rewritten as a composition of several tensor products. We now apply the idea to computing the tensor product of any keys. So we first decompose each of the any keys into a sequence of multiplication stages and addition stages. Then we apply the idea by grouping the multiplication by grouping the multiplication stages together. And we claim that for the tensor product of multiplication stages, they can compute it in a much cheaper way. The observation is that for the same entry in a tensor product of multiplication stages, there are for, there are several coefficients such that are multi, there are multiple uh, Twitter factors to be, to be multiplied. So if we multiply the Twitter factors, then we save the we save multiplications. After some calculations, uh, you'll find that the number of multiplications is reduced from two times q zero q one minus q zero minus q one to q zero q one minus one. In terms of notation. I'll use Redis R0 R1 butterfly for the tensor product of Redis R0 butterfly and Redis R1 butterfly. We first look at how to improve the naive computation. And I'll explain with the Redis 3 cases. The naive butterfly computation for Redis 3 is to first compute the partial products, which are underlined with long multiplications and Mongolian reduction, and that together takes four cycles. After summing the C0 to all the partial, pro partial results, we find that we only need 15 cycles if C is not equal to one and 12 cycles otherwise. The question here is that in Redis 2 case, there is a subtraction there, but somehow the subtraction disappears in Redis 3. And in fact, this leads to our optimization. So if we look at the third partial result, is actually the negative of the sum of the first two partial results. So instead of computing with long multiplications and Mongolian reduction, we simply add the first two partial results. So here's a resulting uh, improved naive computation. So line, in line six, after computing the first two partial results, we perform an addition for computing the negative of the third partial results. This is how we save uh, three cycles for each of the Redis 3 butterflies. You can generalize it to arbitrary Redis R butterflies by observing that the summation of the result of any keys must be an R multiple of C0. So pick a specific J and move everything to uh, the other side. Then we find that for C of C times omega R to the J, we only need R minus one additions and subtractions. I'll skip to this slide. Next, we look into more details about Good Thomas FFT. In the literature, uh, ACE plus 21 proposed to merge the permutation with three layers of Redis to Kulituli butterflies. In our paper, we argue that we should instead merge the commutation of Redis three butterflies. In particular, uh, we formulate uh, the Redis three, two butterflies. And there are two reasons why this is more beneficial. The first reason is that for multi-line two polynomials with convolutions that are least of double size, uh, the input of convolution, uh, the, in the, for the input of convolution, half of our entries are zeros. So we'll save more if we compute registry butterfly at the beginning. The second reason is that uh, we will mostly compute many layers of Redis 2 butterflies. So 
if we compute a layer of Redis 3 butterfly, then the follow up Red Redis 2 butterflies are sometimes cheaper. Another detailed consideration about Good Thomas FFT is about the code size issues of, for the implicit permutations. Uh, after a systematic study for computing the tensor product of size uh, 2 to the K0 NDP and the size 3 to the K1 NDP, we find that we need a code for 3 to the 2K1 minus 1 dedicated Redis 3 to butterflies. And want this quantity to be as small as possible to have an implementation with compact code size. For the first two convolutions, they emit compact code size implementations. But for the third convolution, size, uh, size 1728, we need something like 243 dedicated Redis, two, Redis 3 2 butterflies, and this is unacceptable for microcontrollers. Our solution goes as follows. We we'll introduce two additional variables, Q tilde and V, for controlling the incompleteness of the FFT. And Q tilde uh, refers to the incompleteness of quality FFT, and V refers to the incompleteness of Good Thomas FFT. Now we formulate the convolution as uh, the FFT as isomorphism from R of x over x to the Q0, the product of all variables minus one to the product rings. Now we return to the, uh, for addressing the cosine issues for the convolutions. If we look at the size 1728 convolution, we cannot choose V as one because as shown in previous slides, there's a severe cosine issue. So we instead choose V to be three. And now Q1 is, can be written as the square of three, which emits compact cosine implementations. Now I show the overview as overall performance of our results. We first uh, have an overview for the polynomial locations. So I will compare it to the state of implementation for n true n true prime. In n true, uh, the state of our implementation is called topic matrix uh, implementation. I suggest everyone to look into the papers because they are, they are actually very interesting ideas. For, for the n true prime implementation, we compare it to the mixed redis uh, entity based approach without changing the coefficient ring. So each of the entity in the, in the reference CHE21 are only designed for specific parameters. Across uh, the different schemes, our entity-based uh, polynomial location can be, across, can be applied. And the reason is that we simply compute the result in Z of X. So the size 1440 convolution in Andrew is comparable to the size 1440 convolution in Andrew prime. And these are the detailed numbers about the polynomial locations. You can find that the only differences between uh, the size of, con uh, the, of the same of the polynomial locations based on the same size of convolutions are the final maps, which compute the, which reduce the result in this of X to the target polynomial rings. And these are the numbers for entry prime. For the overall performance, uh, we integrate all the existing optimization for entry. In particular, uh, the key generation by Li21, which implements a jump, set, jump, set, jump diff set uh, uh, optimization. We also integrate the crypto sword. Actually, we uh, replace the sorting in entry with the one with entry prime because we found it more optimized. Finally, we'll also integrate the topology modification because it is useful for computing the inverses. So this is our uh, overall performance result of entry. As for entry prime, uh, we compare to the existing work, which is uh, ACC plus 21 and CH, CHE21. And there is a performance uh, degree in terms of the entry LPR in the encryption of the 
of entry LPR. And the reason is that previously it was, uh, they used secret dependent table look of AES. And your paper was switched to the uh, bit size AES. I'd like to tell some something, some future works. The first thing is uh, the implementation of vectorization friendly Good Thomas FFP. In particular, uh, how to utilize the equivalence of X to the V and the product of two variables. The idea was implemented in FP07 with SSE, and recently. It was also implemented in the NKBS RSA 1496 in BHK plus 22 with NVE. And we'd like to know the performance about the idea for NEON, AVX2, and AVX512. Next, uh, the, another future direction is to explore the vectorization for multiplying bit by bit polynomials in entry prime. In BBC, T21, the authors propose registry Schoenhager for vectorization. Now we want to know what is the role of the already existing root of unity and how to combine the vectorization friendly good Thomas FFT and Schoenhager. Thank you for your attention. We have um, time for questions. It's a very quiet audience. Um, questions are included in the price of registration. <laughs> um, let me ask you about portability of your results. This is uh, something I'm wondering when you, um, also in your previous talk, so you, you target to a specific microcontroller and 3M4, how closely are your results tied to a specific architecture? Are you using, um, for example, assembly coding for everything? Or is your result easily portable to, let's say, risk five or a different microcontroller? Uh, while, developing, while developing the assembly optimized imitation, so all of these are assembly code, but while developing the code, I have written some C code for like, uh, it's like a generic type, generic program in C. So there are pointer automatic, a lot of messy printer automatics for realizing the, uh, the merging of multi-layer qualitative butterflies. And since all the code are written entirely in C, so they should be portable to RISC-V, I believe. I never work on RISC-V, but if they're compatible with C, then it should work. Thank you. Questions? <clears throat> Let me also ask you a question I to the previous uh, speaker. Will your results be available as a chess artifact? As an artifact? Yes. Uh, we, uh, we go through the, the PPM for like infrastructure for the uh, for the artifact. So you will find easily used if you are familiar with PPM4, but you're also very easy to use. Great, and like a GitHub repository or? An... Oh, uh, the repository. Uh... Oh, it's listed, okay. Uh... Okay, I forgot to put the website, but the repository is shown in our paper. In paper. So you, you should find, you can find it. Excellent. Thank you. All right, let's thank the speaker. So we now come to the final talk in this session. The talk will be given by Bo Yen Yang. The title is Verified Entity Implement Multiplications for NIST PQC KM Lattice Finalists, Kyber, Sabre, and NTRU. And it's a joint work with Jukxiang Liu, Xiaomo Shi, Vincent Wang, Min Xin Tsai, Bo Yang Wang, Gregor Seiler. How does this work?
Yeah, sorry, I have a pretty big skull. <laughs> okay, so I'm the only uh, uh, obstacle between uh, everybody here and lunch. So I try to keep this brief. We are trying to talk about uh, and verified entity modifications uh, for all this uh, optimized uh, um, multiplication code that's used in uh, Kyber, Saber, and Entrude, which are the NISC lattice finalists. I mean, I think this is. Uh, uh, well known by now that uh, we need new crypto systems that stand up to quantum computing, uh, which are called post-quantum cryptography. And the NIST is running a standardization process and that had seven finalists and eight alternates in the third round. And uh, the three lattice camps that are finalists are Kyber, Saber, and True. And we know that all these are uh, implemented and um, often in handcrafted assembly language. There are people who argue that you should never do that. You should use a, a design to be correct approach. But there are others who, who say that you should write fast code and try to make sure that it's correct. And we are arguing for the latter here. Note that PQC are uh, more complex algorithms than RSA and ECCs, and they have larger state. So this is going to be harder than um, pre-quantum software to verify. But uh, the main question is, how do we avoid bugs in PQC implementations? And our answer is to do formal verification rather than testing. Um, to test, I mean, just take a easy uh, routine such as 25519, and there are two to the 500 inputs. And how many of them can you possibly test? I mean, the answer is a vanishing small proportion. So, I mean, as Dijkstra says, testing shows the presence and not the absence of bugs. To show the absence of bugs, we need formal verification. And what we are using is a, a model checker, crypto line that consists of a domain spe specific language and a tool to verify programs in the domain specific language. And we substitute support two kinds of predicates, an algebraic one and a range predicate. Our contributions is that we are the first verification of the entities. And we do not argue that these are the only entities or the best entities. They are merely the fast test entities for which we have the source code for both the Intel AVX2 and the ARM Cortex M4, which are the NIST selected programs to benchmark. We also extended the CryptoLine tool so that verification becomes uh, either possible or much faster. All these are public code and you can find them in the GitHub directories. So, and somebody uh, already gone through NTTs. So we are just going to mention that uh, the incomplete NTT uh, in Kyber from PQ Crean does the following sequence of isomorphisms. Um, it goes from Z of uh, 3329 of X uh, over X to the 256 plus one into a bunch of uh, smaller rings multiplied together uh, where zetas are the rules of unity. And we decompose the verification problem at each level 
but it's actually more complicated than that because um, the complexities of scheduling and we only use over 256 coefficients at, in level zero. And then we split it into the top half and the bottom half and do the other six layers separately for top and bottom. And this leads to a problem in classical compositional reasoning where each stage depends on the previous stage and only the previous stage. That's very common in formal verification. To actually do a Kyber NTT verification, what we do is that we first extract a running trace from assembly. So you actually make an executable and you run our script to extract the particular routine that you want to have verified. So you have something that's basically a running trace in assembly. And we then you define translation rules between assembly and crypto line instructions, which are basically standard and reusable, although there are some situations where it requires you to know something about the program because you there are some things that are, for example, masks, mask constants, I mean other constants, and you need to know what they stand for to make the correct translation rule. Having made these rules, you translate the running trace to a crypto line program, and you initialize the constants used in the subroutine using some uh, like uh, manual additions. Finally, you add preconditions, postconditions, and mid conditions which are dependent on the program and you need to, some knowledge of the program. Okay, after you add all of this, there's no further human interaction. You run crypto line. And here is the example run, which verifies the Kyber entity. And this uses a small server in our cluster. This is not a super server. You can see that it has only 12 cores and 24 uh, threads. And it only used 454 seconds, which is less than eight minutes. So in eight minutes, it shows that the Kyber entity runs correctly for all inputs. So to explain, What's the deal with classical and improved compositional reasoning? In classical compositional reasoning, each stage of reasoning only depends on the previous stage. But it's very common that we have a cut that is P0 and P1 and, 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 and P2 to the 127. And then we have the same ones with Q0, Q1, all the way to Q127. And each PI can derive each QI, but they intersect. So you cannot partition them in a meaningful way. And our idea is to do non-local compositional reasoning. We introduce primitives to jump around in the stages. So first you prove P0 all the way to P127. And then you show that each individually is true, which is obvious and is trivial. And then you prove each of the QIs with, of, with help of the individual PIs, which you can do. And finally you end them all together and that's it. So that's non-local compositional reasoning, and it makes impossible um, verifications possible and uh, slow verifications a lot faster. And finally, um, there is uh, a different kinds of NTTs. Uh, one that's not introduced in the previous talks is a twisted NTT, which basically um, is the gentleman sent version of NTT. You take fx over x to the 2n minus 1 and split it. 
into fx to the over x to the n minus one and fx over x to the n plus one, then you change the system so that and it becomes two identical rings multiplied together. And there are two approaches of specifying this twisted entity with or without the fresh variables. And we, we can do it with both. I mean, and we happen to pick whatever happened to work first. So if you look at our artifact, and I mean, you will see two kinds of uh, um, approaches. I mean, and that's because basically the verifier is different in the two cases. I mean, two different people did the verification. Here is our verification results. And you see that um, the cheapest verification took less than eight minutes. The most expensive verification took about six hours. So it's not a big deal. You can do this every time you put out production code you don't you can write everything by hand and by the time you really need to publish your code you make sure it's correct you have plenty of time for this and by the way we are using a very uh, i mean it's tiny bitty server i mean if you have a super server it's going to be faster by the way, cuts does make uh, the verification faster, and but there is uh, the law of diminishing returns. So after a certain number of cuts, you don't do any better. Finally, the most important part is war time. Each of our verification took less than a week on the calendar. And most of it is not writing crypto line code. It's talking to the programmer himself to make sure that we understand what's going on. And then we make the correct annotations that makes the verification possible. So what we finally can say we did is that we demonstrate the possibility that you can eat your own slap. You can write your own handcrafted assembly program that runs the fast test and then make sure that is correct. Furthermore, you can take somebody's fast program and make sure that is correct. And we enhanced compositional reasoning. And finally, we found a few well-hidden bugs in high-speed software. We didn't mention this, but our tools include um, how to find the errors from like the outputs when it doesn't verify. So we actually did locate a few bugs. And there's a few future, some future work um, for other schemes, for other kind of PQCs. And we now have branched into asymmetric cryptography so that we can do the entire Kyber rather than just the NTT. Thank you very much, and I'm ready to take questions. We have time for a few questions. There's a question, Peter. Thank you very much for the nice talk. So at the end, you mentioned the box that you found, and at the beginning, you used this example of um, big integer multiplication as something which has very, very large input space. Potentially, there's very few inputs that would trigger the box. You also said that the box that you found were well hidden. So is it safe to assume that we have similar, extremely low probability box, not just in big integer arithmetic, but also in polynomial arithmetic that you find? Uh, I mean, being that programmers, I mean, even very good programmers are human. I mean, so, I mean, so one of the uh, bugs that we we saw was that, and um, the 
it's the equivalent of skipping a carry. The programmer wrote the wrong register to memory. And it only happens, it only affects the result in about, I think, uh, two to the uh, 48 uh, out of, I mean, every, uh, I mean, uh, one out of every 200, uh, for two to the 48 times uh, of multiplication that it makes a difference. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's exactly the kind of thing that I was make. Thanks. So, so question. The question is the level and what people of management time we talked about. I'm saying that the coverage in that time was in the and all the inputs were very high. And what was the scheme uh, that you used to generate the inputs for your target? Sorry, I. Uh... I'm not uh, um, at my best this morning, uh, but so I, I didn't quite catch all your question. Okay, maybe. So uh, the time that you showed in your project slide is less than a week to complete the verification. Um, is that covers 100% of the inputs for the target that you were going to Well, okay. So I mean, starting from the time that we started to talk to the, uh, we, we first identify a scheme that's uh, published somewhere in on the web already, started talking to the um, programmer about his code and to figure out where, how this is partitioned, how does each and of the special numbers that's included is used and so on and so forth. And then we do the translation. And uh, I mean, and finally, by the time we run the verification, we have basically, I mean, understood what he was doing. So and if you are, if what you are implying is that for more complex uh, crypto systems, maybe we will end up taking more time. Uh, sure. I. I agree, but uh, I mean, you know, Kyber is already a com pretty complicated uh, system. It's not going to get that much harder than Kyber to understand. Questions? So, um, I'm curious about uh, the following. With formal verification, you always make some minimal assumptions on what you assume is already correct. Yes. What are the assumptions that you have made in your proofs? Okay, you have to uh, trust uh, a few mathematical software. And in many cases, we can certify our results. So, um, there are par parts of our tools that you have just, ju you just have to believe. There are parts of the tools that emits mathematical proofs of impossibility. Like this set problem is impossible and it emits the correct proof for everyone to check. And for other um, situations, you have to trust the mathematical software. In some cases, singular. In some cases, uh, um, uh, magma. I mean, you can use a selection, a different selection of tools. I mean, singular is is not is free, right? But magma and mathematica and the maple are not free. We have hooks to those in case you prefer them, right? But uh, um, you have to trust them. Mm -hmm. Now. In some cases, we can certify even that the ideal membership problem that we are doing is correct, but uh, it, sometimes it makes it so slow that it's not useful. Thank you. Final chance for questions. Then let's thank the speaker. Thank you all for coming to the session. We'll have now lunch. Thank you.